Hello there folks, it's Nerdy John here, and finally, after, god, what is it, like, four months, three months, uh, there is an episode of the Nerdy Podcast, and my special guest today is The Wanderer. Hello, nice to be here. Hello, hello. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, The Wanderer is mainly, mainly a uh, Fallout YouTuber, uh, around to 2k subscribers and if you're interested in Fallout War I highly suggest you go check out his channel but other than Fallout today we'll be talking about various topics like such as uh, you know standard YouTube drama stuff because let's be honest almost every you uh, unless you unless your your podcast is highly specific eventually every podcast talks about YouTube drama in some way shape or form we'll also be talking about Star Wars though and you know with the announcement of the Knights of the Old Republic remake, um, I feel like we'll have a lot to discuss about, especially with speculation for that game, since, you know, we just got the teaser trailer. Hell yeah. Dude, that was a, an absolute, like, blast, by the way. I, oh, I am yeah. super fucking hyped for that. Although, although can, I, can I nitpick here? It's, it's weird that the remake is going to be a PS5 exclusive, considering that the original series was an Xbox original. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's pretty much like, turn the tables I guess um, it's it's super fucking weird but um, mm -hmm. I suppose at the end of the day you know it's coming to PC and it'll be on Xbox at some point from I, I, I believe that's what most people are saying so as long as oh, it's on so PC like, I'm happy so like what they're doing is like it's gonna be like a year exclusive for like PS5 and then it's gonna reach out to the other platforms yeah I think so it's, it's gonna be like kind of I believe it's what they did with a lot of Call of Duty DLCs back in the day. I don't know if it's the same thing, because I haven't played oh, Call gotcha. of Duty in years. But, like, they used to release Call of Duty DLCs a month prior to Xbox on PS4 and, like, PS3. So hmm. I think that's basically what they're doing, but it'll probably be, uh, uh, like you said, probably about a year. Okay, so, like, here's my main worry about the remake. We're not even going to talk about the writing yet. We're not even going to talk about, like, if they're going to change the story, this or that. Because, like, we all know, like, the, the, the twist in uh, KOTOR 1. My main concern is how, the, how they will do the gameplay. Because the gameplay of KOTOR is, it's, it's very specific. It's basically, like, um, it's a, it's a um, prototype version of, like, the Dragon Age combat, where... You know, it's basically a 3D version of the Baldur's Gate games, which use a D&D &D randomizer for, like, all their moves, you know? Because, like, how the stat system works and everything. Yeah. So, like, my main concern is that they're just going to turn this into a more generic uh, action game with just a little bit of RPG elements, you know? Yeah, I mean, honestly, if I could change the gameplay in any way... Um, obviously, the option is to keep to keep it the same, and I'd all I'd be all for that. Maybe make it a less a uh, little less uh, clunky, a little bit more easy mm -hmm. to read on the hood. Um, but honestly, if they went with uh, like gameplay and combat specifically, similar to that of uh, I don't know, like Jedi Fallen Order or something, I, I think that could work quite well. But um, obviously, mm -hmm. it would need to be done quite specifically, and I honestly would be very comfortable with it just being the same. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would prefer it to be the same. I don't really see it going down the the uh, Fallen Order route because that was more Dark Souls based gameplay. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, um, go, go ahead. All right. Uh, I, I basically mean, um, this is somewhat of a more live action gameplay instead of a turn based. That, I think that's what I mean by that. Oh yeah. Um, I, I would prefer it to be, um, d to have like the more turn based elements, and I, I hope when it comes down to the core of the game that they don't get rid of that D&D &D element because I thought that was like that really made the game unique because like I mean I know we've had like Star Wars tabletop games in the past but like it was really cool seeing like a D&D &D type element in Star Wars related media yeah I'll agree there and I think if there's one thing that I'm quite concerned for is how um, RPG games in the last couple of years um, looking at you Fallout 4 have kind of <laughs> had a bit of a, I suppose you could call it a simplification of the way uh, character creation and skills 
and things like that oh, yeah. are, are basically built and how they affect gameplay and how they affect your character and your stats. Um, Fallout 4 in particular had them simplified so very heavily compared to um, 3 in New Vegas, which in mm. my opinion did it very good. I, I really like the way that, um, you know, classic Fallout 3 and New Vegas did the way that you would customize your characters. Uh, skills, traits, perks, stuff like that. I thought that was all fantastic. But Fallout 4 um, wanted this big skill tree kind of thing with the, the big yeah. poster that I've actually got on my wall. Um, and then also, they, they didn't have, you know, speech, barter, things like that. I feel, I feel like using elements like that really helps flesh out gameplay. And yeah. I, we don't Whoa. see many RPGs like that on the market anymore. I think KOTOR was a really unique game, and to see it ship with the you know the same characteristics and the, the same charming gameplay that the um the original one and the original two uh, both launched with uh, i think that would be a really unique market because not many games really do that anymore yeah like i remember i i feel bad because i can't name any specific quest by because like you had like the you know your standard two options of just killing the guy and taking whatever item you needed or doing like the quest related to that item or i remember like depending on your persuasion stats or your jedi mind tricks uh, your, your charisma like i remember like there being options of you just de either de-escalating situations or bartering to get the item that you needed without doing a quest line but still getting the xp for it and like Oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I wasn't saying anything. I was just breathing. <laughs> oh, I think I think it was just the feedback. Yeah, um, my, my Discord's a bit weird sometimes. It, like, picks up the other person's mic but doesn't spit it out, if you know what I mean. So it, it like, yeah. still captures my mic, but for some reason it's detecting, like, your mic, for example. It's a bit weird. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, uh, but back to what I was saying. with Like, KOTOR was from that era of where... Western RPGs were basically like just set versions of uh, D and D campaigns, because you had like a pretty open endedness on like how you build your characters and stats. Like, and depending on the game, you could choose like your race, you know, class abilities. Whereas Western RPGs nowadays are kind of just first person. Uh, I mean, depending on the game, obviously, but like, yeah. for, I'll, I'll use I always use Skyrim as an example. I would I you could make the argument that Skyrim isn't even an RPG. Like, it, it, it's it's a first person adventure game with slight RPG elements, but like none of like what you would consider an RPG is there besides a besides like some quest lines. Yeah. Because like. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, you can raise your persuasion ability and stuff, but, like... Yeah, you have to skill trade and stuff, don't you? Yeah, yeah, like... Like, the, like the speech in in Skyrim is very different from, like, speech... Uh, again, again to, to relate it back, to, it's very different from KOTOR. Because, like, you could only use persuasion in, uh... I'm sorry, speech in, like, very specific instances if you weren't, like, buying, bu buying items and stuff. So, so, like, it was a yeah. very niche skill that you would hardly... Unless you specifically went out to uh, uh, grind for it, you, would, you wouldn't you would even, like, really use it at all, or... Like, there was no way to raise it up unless you were purposefully, like, breaking the game. Because, you know, the Dawnstar chest thing, where you, you just sell the Kiji Caravan all their items back and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, I've only ever seen, I'm about to admit, like, a, a terrible heresy, okay? I've never played Skyrim, I've only seen gameplay. How dare you? How <laughs> dare you play the most generic game ever? How dare you not play it? Dude, the, uh, the fucking gods are at my fucking, the federal agents are outside my home for, for admitting <laughs> that. <laughs> dude, dude, do you remember, do you ever, do you ever watch Angry Joe? Angry Joe, I've watched him occasionally. I think the last thing I watched from him was his 76 review. Oh, dude, like, he did, uh, he was, like, the guy who got Skyrim to become popular. And, like, he, that was a, he very rarely gives out, like, 10 out of 10, especially nowadays, because he doesn't do that particular review format anymore. But, like, 
he would he gave it a 10 out of 10 everyone everyone basically like like unanimously agreed with him and like uh, Skyrim isn't a bad game I'm not trying to insinuate that but like there's not very, there's not a lot of meat and potatoes if, if you get what I mean but wait, wait let, let me let me re rephrase that there's a lot of meat and potatoes but the meat is just cooked and the potatoes aren't seasoned if that makes any sense yeah I get you I kind of get what you mean yeah I suppose at the end of the day it comes down to uh, uh, various different opinions like I, I know people that hold um, Fallout 3 in a high regard compared to, I don't know, New Vegas, which in my opinion, New Vegas is definitely probably uh, my favorite Fallout game. I think it's probably Agreed. the most well-written one and the most uh, diverse and, you know, uh, they, they've really kind of carefully thought about the lore, but I see why people criticize it for, you know, uh, you know like not having as many uh, barter speech checks or like different uh, mm. speech checks and compared to like speech itself. And also people, a lot of people seem to think that the map is kind of empty, which I, I sort of see, but at the same time, uh, I find it kind of interesting and uh, in some aspects quite calming, just patrolling the Mojave, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, yeah. But a lot of people prefer Fallout 3 is more, I, I guess you could say Fallout 3 is a bit more compact. There's a lot more going on in the Capital mm -hmm. Wasteland, so I can see why people would prefer it, and I guess it's the same with Skyrim. Like, a lot of people hold Skyrim in high regard. Yeah, I mean, this is this is my problem with uh, Bethesda as a company. Uh, they 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 continuously simplify their games, cause like it, if we go from like uh, Mor Morrowind to Oblivion, there there's a massive like step in simplification. I mean, some would some would argue for the better, uh, you, 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 but like you, there's still that shift there. And then going from Oblivion to Skyrim, I, I would say that's an even bigger, like, leap, you know? Yeah, yeah, I kind of get what you mean there. I, I'd say, especially, you know, say if a person who's new to Fallout is only sticking to the main, you know, four games. and doesn't want to play any spin-offs like, you know, 76, New Vegas, Brotherhood of Steel, um, things like that. If they're just playing the main games and they go from, you know, Fallout 2 to Fallout 3, that's a pretty sizable jump and it's obviously mm -hmm. understandable why that is. But going from Fallout 3 to Fallout 4, in my opinion, is even more jarring. Not only oh, is the gameplay God, yeah. a lot better, but the RPG elements are a lot worse. And I feel like that's a pattern with Bethesda. Um, I feel like, in, in a way, Bethesda have kind of got lazy with their writing and lazy with the way they're handling oh, yeah. the RPG sides of their RPGs. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm really hoping um, Starfield uh, makes up for that in a way, because obviously it, it, Starfield is very highly anticipated in you know communities that are surrounding RPGs and specifically you mm -hmm. know Fallout, Elder Scrolls, people like that. They're really looking forward to this game because it's yeah, basically I, Todd Howard's baby. So <laughs> that's why I'm worried about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure it'll but, be all right. Uh, did they are they using the same engine uh, with this one, or are they making a new one? They've announced a new one to the uh, delight of many different people. I I, uh, I assume the creation crap, engine not... two, as they're calling. It's not just a modification this time. Well, I think it's like they've they've took the basic tools of you know creation engine one and Gamebryo and kind of upped it a bit. Kind of what yeah. uh, you know uh, Halo Infinite. I don't know if you play Halo, but. Halo Infinite's got a new engine as well called Slipspace compared to Blam, which is what they were using since 2001 with the original no, one. Guys. And uh, yeah, so they decided, you know, we want to make a more expansive game. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to take the elements of the Blam engine and upgrade it to create the Slipspace engine. I feel like that's exactly what Bethesda have done with the creation engine. But hopefully they've done it a lot better, you know. I'm yeah, because like the creation engine was technically the engine they've been using to make games since Morrowind. I know it was under a different name, and like yeah, technically yeah. it's a different engine. But it, let's be honest, it's the same engine with just, with just like slight modifications. The Gamebryo engine was the original the one. Yeah, the Gamebryo engine, and then they made mod they made some modifications to it, and then they made the create creation engine. Yeah. So like technically you're I, you've I... been working on the same engine since like 2002 pretty much yeah i mean um well i mean that could go for the same thing for for a lot of different games i suppose but um 
I, I like to say the Gambryon creation engine are quite different. Uh, the creation engine, I believe, was first used for Skyrim. Let me just quickly Google that. Yes, uh, yes it was. Yeah, so creation engine is from like Skyrim, Fallout 4, 76 onwards. Um, and now obviously we're getting creation engine 2 in 2022 with Starfield. Um, but Gambryon was like, uh, I believe... It was Fallout New Vegas was the last one to use Gambrio, and then uh, uh, like the earliest yes, one was, was Morrowind. So, uh, yes, because New Vegas came out 2010, Skyrim came out 2011. Was it 2011? I thought it was uh, a year after, like 2012. No, no, no. Uh, 2011. 2011. Oh, I always get my dates mixed up with the, the with those games. Like I know New Vegas is 2010. But then I was like, oh, well, they wanted to release Skyrim two years later, so it didn't interfere with the, uh, you know, the, 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 the no. sales, you know? No, yeah, be well, be because um, Ob Obsidian was working on New Vegas, the main Bethesda team was working on the, the next uh, Elder Scrolls game. Well, yeah, um, they, they probably were working on the engine. Uh, first, they were probably working on that engine from, say, when they finished all of the DLCs for Fallout 3, they handed over mm -hmm. the tools to um, Obsidian and said, yo, you want to make a game in 18 months? And I'm like, sure. Uh, and then... <laughs> and, and hey, hey, if if uh, they make the quota, then we'll give you the money. I'm sorry, the <laughs> bonus money. <laughs> the one point. <laughs> oh, yeah, which uh, I, I, I just find hilarious because... Um... Oh, hang on, hang on. So, so back to what I was saying, um, I, I just thought it was funny how, but despite the fact it sold admirably well, they didn't give Obsidian the bonuses. And then a couple years later, uh, Fallout 76 sold even less than New Vegas. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite ironic, I suppose, in a sense. Um... I, I don't know, I, I don't really know much about what happened with the, the the critic scores and stuff. Um, I do know they were one point off, and uh, I don't believe there's any hard feelings between Obsidian and no, Bethesda. No, no, there isn't. However, yeah, I, I, I still think it's like a massive bummer. And just to think, you know, if New Vegas wasn't riddled with bugs like it was in the first place, before obviously all those bugs, or most of them got patched, um, it probably would have scored a bit mm -hmm. higher. What? And that's what that's what. Yeah, stinks. I think if they were given a more generous uh, development time, maybe instead of eighteen months, you make it a full two years. Probably, probably would have had a very very nice product. I mean, the product that's already there yeah, is I, just I, amazing. Like absolutely, like grade t grade A tier um, development. Yeah, I, I'd agree that I'd say New Vegas is absolutely. Uh, a game to behold in its narrative mm -hmm. as well as you know obviously having that solid fallout 3 gameplay it's in an interesting location the dlcs are amazing yeah. um but yeah if it was given that extra development time i i genuinely would be interested to see what that would look like in a parallel universe like say uh you know marvel's what if fallout <laughs> new vegas got two years extra <laughs> development that would be very, very interesting because um, there's a lot of code content. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. a lot. That's where the the meme where, you know, like Fallout New Vegas fans explaining how the game could be <laughs> better. That's where that meme comes from, basically, because there's so much code content. Like, Triangle City, I don't know if you've heard of him. I, but I, I have not. Dude, that guy has... He's, he's, a, he's a YouTuber who covers all of the code content in New Vegas, and he's about to wrap it up. There's, like, 65 mm -hmm. parts to it. And each one's between 20 minutes and an hour. That's how much good content there is in New Vegas. And to see all that, like, you know, polished up and added into the game would be interesting. Um, I, I think part of what helped New Vegas was the writing team was mostly consisted of a lot of Fallout 1 and 2 developers, actually, because uh, the people of that team... Unfortunately, um, they got dissolved, and so a lot of them went to yeah. B Black Isle kind of fell yeah, through. Yeah, so and so they went to various different companies, and one of them happened to be uh, Obsidian. And like I know, Fallout One and Two are very clunky games. You know, they're very. Uh, if you're not a fan of isometric gameplay, I would say it's the Fallout, Fallout One and Two are even rougher than like Boulder's Gate One and Two. So, but like it, 
they are definitely like a hard pill to swallow at times. I remember first playing Fallout One and being like, "Holy shit, yeah, that's weird." Here. But like in a writing <laughs> aspect, those games are just top notch. And the fact that you have the same like writers who worked on like all the various into in, like various quests of those two games is really awesome. So like I think that's partly what helped yeah. it. Whereas uh, Fallout Three in Fallout 4 especially they had like the standard Bethesda writing team and so like it was very it was very like uh, by the numbers yeah I they really didn't go where I'd say Obsidian are quite well known for taking that extra step into their narrative mm -hmm. and their lore like for example uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old oh Republic 2 is one of the dude, best written dude. games I've ever I, played I will, I will die on this hill KOTOR 2 is not all, is the best Star Wars game of all time. I think you are you're perfectly entitled to say that to be honest. If I had to make a choice, it would it would be between the first two KOTOR mm -hmm. games, like for the top Star Wars game, followed by OG Battlefront 2, yes, Republic yes. Commando, and maybe Jedi Fallen Order cuz I really <laughs> enjoyed that game. He, he, um I would say this is how it is. For storytelling, um, KOTOR Tour 2 is the best. For like, if you want to understand, like not understand, but like if you want to get a feel for like how chaotic, um, like just like the Star Wars warfare is, you play like Republic Commando or uh, Bal Battlefront 2. If you want a good like uh, force user simulator, you play Forced Unleashed 1. That's a good choice, actually. I, I feel like, in in my kind of headspace, in in my mind, I've I've kind of pushed the Force Unleashed to the mm. side of it, because I was like, oh, that well, you know, it's a very cool concept. You know, you've got Star Killer, this this apprentice or ex-apprentice of Darth Vader, who's like this really powerful person that they've managed to make Force yeah. clones of, and then looking back, I was like, mm, I mean, the, it's just kind of the, a, the, the story was very dumb, but the gameplay was very good uh no and, yes and, yes I'll and, agree and like with that. uh fallen order and um fallen order and forced unleash are following two different types of patterns forced unleash is following the god of war type of action character action game whereas fallen order is following obviously the dark souls format and like in, in a way you yeah. can say that the two games uh have different like show off different sides of like a force user whereas like with um with uh, Fallen Order, it shows like the more precise uh, calculating side of a Force user, whereas like Forced Unleashed shows off like the more like raw power side of a Force user. Yeah, so I suppose you're kind of right there. It's um, in a way, ironically, Forced Unleashed is like um, the dark side, and Jedi Fallen Order is like the light. <laughs> um, I suppose is is kind of a good way to put oh, it there. Um... Uh, do, you, do you remember, like, people were upset because, uh, they revealed that the main character was, uh, was going to be a ginger? I don't remember that. I don't, I, to be honest, I, I was kind of out of... Uh, after the release of The Last Jedi, I kind of fell out with Star Wars. I don't blame you. But I've always been, like, you know heart and soul I've always been a Star Wars fan since like the age of four when I watched the oh, original. Oh dude, my and... introduction was the uh, the the the, um, the Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan, and Darth Maul duel. That was the first piece of Star Wars media I remember seeing and like it was just like a very I it was it was a very powerful moment for me because like you have like the, the music playing, you have like these different um these different angles that they're working with you have like these very complicated martial arts technical not necessarily martial arts but acrobatic techniques technically but you you get what i mean like you it was a very um impactful moment for me yeah i i kind of get what you mean there because um i think i finished the original movies and went to watch the prequels and I remember at the age of like six, bawling my eyes out at Order sixty six. <laughs> I, I was like, I couldn't stop crying. Uh, um, dude, dude. And then like the the year after, I started watching Clone Wars, and I was like, fuck yeah, I love the clones yeah, now. Yeah, like oh my. <laughs> with, with, with the context of Clone Wars, the the prequel trilogy becomes so much better. 
Yes, I'll agree that it's like um, I'm trying to think of a good food anagram, but it's like you know you add a like a, a special like sauce or like some seasoning. Or you know how you use that potato mm -hmm. in seasoning uh, anagram yeah. before. Oh, it, well, it's not really an anagram. It's like a, yeah. a metaphor. Um, it's it's basically that like um, it, it's like you know the added seasoning, I suppose, to the the prequel trilogy, which in in my opinion. If you ignore Revenge of the Sith, is very kind of bland. Bar maybe that Qui Gon and Darth Maul fight. Mis, Mis, not gonna ruin the movie. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, dude. Uh, imagine an alternate universe where that theory of like Jar Jar being a Sith Lord becoming true. Star Wars, what if Jar Jar was the Sith Lord? <laughs> dude, dude. Oh, they, like they would have to like make it an entirely alternate story, or like explain why he's not there in the original trilogy. Then. Yes. Oh, dude, that'd like, be that's so the good. one hole. I, I do want to see some like I, I want to see like some Old Republic content with Gungan Sith yes. Lords. I think that'll be good. Because uh, like. Um, <laughs> Like, like I, I, I get like when you when when you first look at the theory, it makes sense. But like the massive hole in that is, well, what did, what does Jar Jar do afterwards? You know, like what happened to him afterwards? Like, cause he's clearly not there in uh, Return of the Jedi. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, he became like a, a child's entertainer yeah. or something, like a, basically yeah. a clown. He became the literal definition. Yeah, he of became clown. like really poor and then like just started entertaining kids in the streets of Coruscant and like so like okay we we both know that the prequel trilogy is uh not not good in a lot of aspects uh would you yeah I'll so agree, if though. you if someone theoretically hel held a blaster to your head would you watch the prequel trilogy or would you watch the sequel trilogy would I watch the prequels or yes. the sequels Ooh, prequels. prequels. Yes, because I, I can explain this. Um, I like a lot of the characters a lot mm -hmm. more. You know, you have that young Obi Wan. You have Padme Amidala, which I used to have a childhood really? crush on. Really, I thought on. she was. I thought have... she was extremely bland. I, I like Padme. Um, you have Anakin, which, especially in Episode Three, is really fucking badass. Mm -hmm. um, you have. The clone troopers, which, while only having limited screen time, are still one of my favorite aspects of Star Wars, especially with the added context mm -hmm. of Clone Wars. And on top of that, you have Jango Fett, who is my all-time favorite bounty hunter. Yeah, so, I, yeah, I'll, I'll take... I remember you saying that in stream, and I would like you to clarify, why is he your favorite? Because, I mean, in, episode, in the context of Episode 2, he doesn't do a whole lot. I mean, he has that tango with Obi-Wan. He kills that one dinosaur looking Jedi in like the battle arena and then he gets killed by Mace Windu yeah I mean he, while he doesn't have a lot to do screen wise um, I think as a kid I liked him because you know he created this entire army and I thought that was really oh, badass okay. he was the literal father of Boba Fett and uh, on top of that he um I, I liked his arm. It was shiny. <laughs> so you, you were more you were but a like, more fan of the purple variant of like the armor that uh, Bobo and uh, Django are known for. Yeah, I uh, I definitely like you know that 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 chrome kind of finish on a uh, Django's mm -hmm. armor, and I especially like in later years um, that fight scene with Obi Wan grew on me, and on top of that, his legends backstory grew on me yeah because like he was actually I absolutely love his legends uh his legends because like, story cause, like he was grown. actually a pretty decent dude like he was actually like a pretty decent mandalorian and then like the death some for some reason the jedi t trusted a group called the death watch and like oh yeah we're, we're just gonna, yeah we're just gonna weird. like that's that's a big hole in that story that the jedi would just randomly trust this group called the death watch yeah i mean Especially when they became liberal terrorists in the Clone Wars, you know, it, it, it does beg the question. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, I do like the fact he was a foundling, and I do like the fact, you know, he was... Um, oh, I forgot his name. Uh, his his mentor was quite an interesting oh, character. Yeah, um, yeah um, and like, you can add... Uh, there, there's, there's a story 
where this was this was before the events of episode two, where Django actually is working with a Jedi. It was actually that long necked Jedi. If you, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I've I've seen yeah. that before. It's yeah, that's a very interesting. And like he uh, actually. Uh, he actually has respect there. for him too and like is actually really sad by his uh, death in the story and yeah. um, um go ahead I, I also kind of like uh, with Django Fett how he has these these little links um, that are established throughout um, canon and legends as well uh, even after his death you know he leaves a legacy like Cad Bane is the next in mm -hmm. line to, to be the quote unquote most notorious bounty hunter, you know? Like Django Fett was the most notorious before him, and now that Django's dead, you know, that leaves his son, that leaves Cad Bane, that leaves, you know, so many oh, different dude. bounty hunters. Uh, by the end of the Clone Wars, you know, you have Fennec Shan, people Did like you that. see that, uh, that, like, that test footage of, like, the unreleased episode of, like, Jing, uh, of, uh, Boba Fett and, uh, oh, 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 you just said his name, shoot, why am I drawing Brank now? Uh, Cad Bane, Cad Bane. Cad, so thank you, sorry. Uh, that unreleased uh, footage of Cad Bane and uh, Boba Fett having a duel, because I forget the context. It was either Bobo was trying to save a girl because he was contracted to do it, or it was it was Kane, it was it, it was it, it was uh, Bane who was contracted to do it. I forget. I think the the I I think that like the the unreleased episodes sort of arc is that um to put it in in somewhat short terms boba fett and cad bane are working together on a mission uh, to claim a bounty they're going to split the reward and they have to round up like a group of hostages but cad uh, I, I think boba doesn't like the way that cad bane is treating the prisoners and so they have a duel about it then they have this western standoff and that's how boba fett gets the dent in his helmet and how uh, spoiler alert if anybody's not watched the bad batch but that's how Cad Bane has that massive metal play. In yeah, time. yeah. Um, by the way, Bad Batch. I'm. I, I actually. I've actually been really liking it. I super enjoyed the uh, first season. I do think it was quite lackluster in character development for the Bad mm -hmm. Batch. I, I liked, you know, the little references here and there. I like seeing, you know, Gregor and Rex. I love seeing all these fan favorite mm -hmm. characters, and Saw Gerrera especially. To, to have a f but five I feel like... I mean, not fives, Echoes. Echo, sorry. Echo, sorry, Echo. Echo. Speaking of Echo, actually, I, I feel like he needed more development, you know? Especially when he was having that conversation with Rex mm -hmm. on Bracca about fives. Like, there was so much potential there to have Echo and Rex open up about their time in the 501st, open up about what happened to Fives and this whole discovery about the yeah. Order 66 and how chips. And how it could have been and prevented, how Anakin could have, like, not gone down this road. Yeah, and, and they, they could have done something really interesting with that scene, but it just never happened. And that's quite disappointing, and I'm really hoping we get to see more development on uh, the Bad Batch characters, um that aren't Crosshair, because I feel like Crosshair is the best written oh, character we got absolutely. that season. Because, like, even before the chip uh, malfunctioned, he was already pretty pretty cold. Like, you could tell he had, like, some yeah. respect for his brothers, but, like, he was already a cold individual as it was. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say he, he loved his brothers. He still does, which is why he didn't end up killing them. Um, however, he feels like, you know, he has the safety and the security in the Empire, they're not going to dispose of him, which is foolish, mm -hmm. um, might I add, because, you know, we, we all kind of have a vague idea of what happens to all of the clones by the end of the, the Clone Wars, you know, there is some sort of mass extinction going to happen, right. and it's definitely going to be the Empire that's at fault. Like, but the, we... the Empire can't just, they can't just let them retire, regardless of the advanced age or not, because you're essentially just letting these advanced soldiers who were specifically bred for combat to just wander off, and you can't let that happen. That's a that's a risk to your empire. Not only that, but the Order 66 chips have been hinted to decay after the initiation. So, you know, we have people like Hauser. Uh, those people might end up turning, or, or even, you know, like in Legends, Clone Rebellion. Mm -hmm. 
if they keep the clones alive, it leads, you know, more problems oh. to the Empire. So that's why I think Crosshair is foolish to believe that he has safety and security in the Empire. And I think it's something that in the next few seasons of the Bad Batch, depending on how many there's going to be, uh, we'll see him waking yeah, up to uh, that. Can you imagine, though, like, being... If the, if the, um... If the chips do decay, like, because, like, they still remember all their actions. They just, like... Can you, can you imagine being a clone that was, like, super close to, like, a Padawan or, like, their Jedi general? And then, like, the, the, it slowly, like, wears off. And then, like, they... they the, the, the realization of what they've done. That that must be awful, dude. I, I honestly hope they explore something oh, like I that. Oh, I remember... Because that would be I remember when we were talking about it when you were streaming a bit. But, like, wouldn't it be awesome if there was an episode... Like, maybe they could even do it with a Bad Batch, you know? Like, maybe send a Sith Inquisitor. But, like, it would have been really awesome to have an episode where there, there are no Jedi, Jedi to help them. And you just have, like, a lone squadron of clones being hunted down by a Sith ap apprentice or something, you know? That would be interesting. And I feel like something like that could work with the Bad Batch and Darth Vader. That could oh, be very, very Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, like, not necessarily Darth Vader, because, like, Darth Vader would, like, just wipe the floor with them. Even he, even their, their commander. He would, but at the same time, it, it'd be like, you know... Um, these guys are advanced clones who are also, you know, commandos. They they are very well trained, and they also have these these mutations mm -hmm. that are making them skilled. And uh, Dave Filoni in particular hasn't been shy about including Beta in the Clone Wars or Rebels. Oh, like yeah. we saw him at the end of season seven of Clone Wars. We saw him in season two of Rebels. I wouldn't put it past him to include, you know, uh, some of these bigger names that we know in Star mm -hmm. Wars, including Vader in the, like, Season 2 or 3 of the Bad Batch, and I think it would be very interesting. I think another thing I would like to see is Moff Gideon. I would love to see an early Moff mm -hmm. Gideon appear in the Bad Batch. That would be very interesting. Um, my personal opinion is, I think instead of Vader, it should be, uh, one of the Inquisitors who died in between, like, the founding of the Empire and then, like, Rebels, because, like, by the time Rebels, uh, fall, uh, we we need to take we need to take Fallen Order into account because that's canon, correct? Fallen Order. Yes, yes, Fallen Order. Yeah, because we need to account for like, we need to keep track of like just how many Inquisitors have died in between uh, the founding and then like Rebels. Yeah. Um. Well, the Bad Batch is obviously like right up after Episode mm -hmm. Three, so I doubt the Inquisitor program is fully finished yet. Much like the Stormtroopers is probably, you know, about to happen or yeah. is slowly being yeah, worked cause... on. Um, however, I, th I like that idea of using the Inquisitors or like an early phase of the Inquisitors. As we know, um, one of the lead Jedi Temple Gods later became the Grand Inquisitor. So seeing him would maybe be Maybe what they should do is like, maybe that's... Maybe, oh wait, I think he, they already did like a, a bunch of missions in the comics, shoot, because I remember the Vader comics were also canon, but like, maybe it would be interesting to see, like, the Grand Inquisitor, like, hunt down, the, the uh, hunt, hunt them down, Bad Batch. I agree there, that would be, and, that'd be and interesting. Like he, that or Yeah, because like, in that episode, you can have it to where it's a ma cat and mouse game, of them just not necessarily trying to hurt him, but basically distract him as long as possible to re relocate their ship. Yeah. I think another interesting character to include in the Bad Batch, um, which they've already hinted at returning in future Star Wars media, is Grand Admiral Thrawn. Oh, dude! Admiral Thrawn is such an interesting character. He's what made Rebels mm -hmm. for me. He's what made Rebels so interesting because that character not only but before he appeared in Rebels, like, you know, back in the Legends days, he's so, so cool. He is like the next Emperor Palpatine, yeah. but more tactical, more, you know, uh, militaristic. Yeah, he's not just like, Whoa, ha, 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 I am evil. Like, he's actually like, he knows when to play cards. He, he knows when to, when to like, um, push measures. He knows what to do. Like he, he's a, a cold, callous, and calculating mm -hmm. individual. Yeah. Um, and seeing seeing him because I believe he actually came into service of the Republic when that was still a thing. But then, 
became uh, a somewhat well-respected member of the Empire. Um, obviously, they don't take too kindly to alien races, but uh, Thrawn was different, and he was like a you know a completely different mm -hmm. case. For I them. thought his new origin was that he trained. He actually went through Empire training. I don't know. I I, th I feel like he was around at the time of the Republic, but I might be wrong. Uh, I'm gonna search this mm -hmm. up because uh, I'm I'm really interested in finding out whether Admiral Thrawn was a uh... yeah he was an agent of the Chiss Ascendancy which was an oligarchic government of the Chiss species that controlled a portion of the unknown region so they were very secreted and had little contact with the rest of the galaxy it was governed by members of prominent ruling families known as the Aristocrat Okay, that, that kind of makes sense. I do believe they... Yeah, I think they might have served... Um... Sometime in the Republic. I, I, I want to say that Thrawn had something maybe, to do with the Republic. Maybe more of an, an advisory role. I might be wrong, though. Yeah, I don't think it would be, like, you know, a Grand Admiral. I think that was much yeah. later on. But, uh... Um, yeah. well, I, th I think, um... One interesting thing... Is... Seeing, like just like the vast change that the um, Republic went from you know to becoming the Empire and seeing like cause like you know we see snippets of like civilians uh, how they're reacting to it in the Bad Batch and it's, it's it, I think it's really interesting cause you go from like this very not necessarily libertarian cause like the Republic had like a very tight grasp on a lot of stuff but like to even go further with that you know yeah, yeah, um, we see multiple different, uh, opinions, uh, I suppose, in the Bad Batch shown, you know, um, I, I forgot the name of the, uh, the planet in the race, but, uh, the planet that is the homeworld of the same character that George Lucas played in Episode 3, um, I forgot his name, I, it might be, it, it's Chairman something, mm -hmm. but his, his planet was very welcoming and very open to an imperial reign. Whereas a separatist planet obviously didn't take too kindly to it. I think it was yeah. Raxus. Um, that was the one, it was kind of a bit of a filler episode where we saw the Bad Batch go and, you know, rescue this separatist yeah. planet. And it's where Echo's really kind of like, oh, we should rescue this guy. He's a fucking, he's, he's, an, he's a separatist, dude. And uh, and then people like Hunter and Tech and Omega's like, you know, we have to help this guy. The, the Republic's gone. <laughs> the Empire. Yeah. yeah, and well, what's interesting is, like, um, the Separatists had a legitimate reason for leaving, but, like, at the same time, the Republic, um, you know, had a legitimate reason for wanting them to stay in the Republic. I think the problem was, it's not that politics were introduced, not, by politics, I don't mean, like, real-world politics, I mean politics in-universe, by the way, because, you know, mm. um, yeah, yeah. Because, like, uh, I know you said you're not a fan of Star Trek, but, like, Star Trek handles, like, in-universe politics very well. I think the problem was it was just George writing the political stuff. So, like, there wasn't yeah. really anyone to, like, oh, maybe, George, maybe there's um, a different way we could approach this, you know? Which, right? Yeah. Which um, the writers for Clone Wars would later um, fix. But I think that was, like, the general problem was... Um, George had so much success from the previous trilogy that people kind of just like, oh yeah, go ahead and do it, George. You know? Yeah, he surrounded himself with yes men, basically. Uh, uh, of course, uh, on the flip side of it, like, you can definitely, you can definitely say that the, it's a, it's a failed vision, but like, ultimately the prequel trilogy is supposed to be a tragedy. And that, that, that was George's vision for it. It succeeded. I couldn't tell you what the vision was for the sequel trilogy at all. Yeah, I, I'd say it succeeded in being a really well-told tragedy, but the way it was executed was quite poor. Mm -hmm. With episode three, are, like, being the best out of all of them. I'd agree that episode three is arguably my favorite because, Star Wars. Because, I'd like, say. again, it's George's direction. The actor who plays Anakin is not a bad actor. It's just, like, he was really whiny in episode two and parts of episode three, but like those scenes where he's just cold-heartedly staring into the camera after his turn, 
is really powerful. Yeah, I, I think Hayden Christensen is a brilliant actor. Same with Ewan McGregor. And I cannot wait to see uh, how they are, you know, acting and how they portray their characters. Oh, I, I'm very I excited for that wait. show. Uh, personally, I would have rather have seen it as a movie, like how it was originally planned. But, you know, I'm still excited that we're getting this content to begin with, you know, with the Mandalorian and everything. Yeah. Speak. I'm liking, uh, to be honest, I, I, would, I wouldn't mind, um, like, you know, movies or a, a live action series like we're getting. Um, I love The Mandalorian, and I do love a lot of the movies. Speaking of, um, because of how popular The Mandalorian is, do you think they'll find a way, somehow, shape, and form to, like, include him in Bad Batch at some, somehow? Or do you think he'll be too young? He'll be way too young. I mean, we saw... The, because the Bad Batch is, like, obviously... Um, right at the end of the Clone Wars. Like, this is this is the end, yeah. basically. So, so at best, um, he'd be a teenager. Not even that. I mean, we saw right at the end of Season 1 of The Mandalorian. He was quite a young child. Um, and there were Separatist Super Battle Droids that were attacking his village. And then he was rescued by Death Watch. So... That might have been... It, it's it's hard to say because I believe the Clone Wars lasted three years. So, oh, yeah, good point, good point. Which is weirdly one of the nicer things so that Death Watch has done. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's weird, but I, I think they did it for personal gain. Oh, honestly. yeah. But, um, oh, and, like, uh, I do have, like... Th th like, this is this is my problem. This is this is my problem with, like, the, the story in general. So, like, um... Correct, uh, correct me. How like how far of a gap was it in between the original trilogy and the prequels in terms of like timeline? Not like not like IRL timeline. I'm talking like in universe. Well, um, obviously Luke and Leia are born during the events of Revenge right, of right. the Sith. So, uh, and Luke Skywalker is 19 by New okay. Hope. That means there is a 19 year gap between. Those Let's round two it up to 20 years. Let's round it up to 20 years. You go in the right. span of 20 years from Jedi being extremely well known throughout the galaxy, having a position of power in the largest political system before the Empire, to becoming mythical legends in like 20 years. And like it works in, in the context I mean, of the original trilogy, but then when like when you introduce a prequel onto that, it's very like um it, 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 it just doesn't work personally for me and then like when in the Mandalorian where, the, where, the, where they're talking about the Jedi oh yeah they're like they're the ancient uh, enemy of our people like you were fighting them like 20 years ago they're not it's not that ancient like there was a little there was a little political like over overthrow uh, involving the Jedi well, I, c I can kind of I, I can uh, somewhat reason with uh, what the the blacksmith was saying in the Mandalorian about the Jedi. Um, the Mandalorians and the Jedi definitely are ancient enemies. I mean, we, we saw it in oh, the oh, Old yeah. Republic with you know the Mandalorians being you know the the Mandalorian Wars is although not canon is an example yeah, yeah. of this. Um, but also, yeah, that um, I suppose uh, Din Djarin as a character as well. Uh, he's written to be this very kind of isolated person growing up so um he was obviously taken oh. as foundling by death watch yeah, I, I... and he was very very isolated and wasn't really taught about other mandalorian beliefs or what else was going on in yeah the galaxy. And, you know this is this is a very interesting point because like in rebels the, a big story point is them doing a mandalorian rebellion you know at, at helping out yeah and then like I, I don't know. I find it very weird that a very warrior, uh, like a, a, a species of the galaxy, whose member, who, whose um, one of their members was the founding father of like an entire clone army. I, I, fi I find it very hard to believe that the um, the Mandalorian side of the rebellion was just wiped out that quickly. Well, the reason they were wiped out, or well, quote unquote, wiped out so quickly, is because um, of events that haven't really been disclosed yet. Uh, for example, the Great Purge, which was mentioned yeah, in the Mandalorian. Then, like, that is one of season these events. Season two, uh, we get 
What was interesting about season two is we get cartoon exclusive characters up here in a live action setting, which I thought was really cool. Yes, dude, Bo-Katan, Ahsoka, that was really uh, amazing to see, dude. I actually bought some some Mandalorian stuff uh, today. I, I got an Ahsoka pop vinyl and a Dark Trooper awesome, pop vinyl. Awesome. And yeah, dude, that that was something I really enjoyed seeing. And I'm hoping, you know, with the Ahsoka show that is planned, uh, we get to see more of that, you know, with um, Ezra and Thrawn and maybe even Captain Rex. I would love to see Captain me. Rex, especially when they've just brought back Me Boba. too, and like, what you you don't even necessarily have to show his face. It's just like a vo voice overdubbing with the helmet. Yeah, um, I think something as well I, I would love to see in Kenobi in particular is flashbacks. I would love to see a flashback of Anakin and Obi-Wan uh, fighting some battle droids with, you know, Captain Rex maybe in the background mm -hmm. with like voiceover dubbing, like you said. That would be so cool to see. Yeah. I would love that oh, so dude, much. Oh, dude, I am, I am very... Um, it's sad, though, that we would never got that um, Boba Fett movie, which I know was turned into the Mandalorian show, but you get what I mean. Because, like, the... Yeah, that, that was Yeah, because, like, the uh, kid actor from um, uh, the prequel trilogy was planned to be the Boba Fett. And I know in... Um, yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because it's been a hot minute since I watched season two, but, like, the guy they got for Boba Fett in season two was completely different dude, right? No, uh, the actor for Boba Fett in The Mandalorian was Temuera Morrison, who played Jango Fett in episode two, and also played a lot of the clones. He, he played uh, Commander Cody and voice acted oh, all of oh, the clone oh, troopers. Wait, my, okay, so my, my, well, my, my point so, is it wasn't like the, kid, the original kid actor. It wasn't the kid actor, but it makes sense because obviously, you know, Boba is a clone of right, Jango. Right, and, so. and like the con in the context of the Boba Fett movie, it was him starting just starting out. So like, it made sense to pick that actor because like while he was older, he was still relatively young. Whereas this is well, whereas yeah. this is a hardened Boba Fett who literally just crawled out of a pit. Yeah, um, I think as well, you know. Uh, a lot of the content that was going to be in the Boba Fett movie, I'm, I'm presuming here, uh, especially if there's going to be a younger Boba Fett, um, I think probably would have been ground covered in the Clone Wars. And maybe it was cancelled because they didn't want to take too much ground from the Clone yeah. Wars. Um, what I'm really worried, can I, uh, I'll be honest, what I'm really worried is like Disney has like just announced like so many different shows. Because, like, we have Visions coming out, which is an, an anthology anime series, which I'm actually really excited for. But then you also have, like, the yeah. spinoff of Rogue One about the character who died. And then, like, you have uh, the Ahsoka spinoff. And then you have the Rangers spinoff. Like, there, there's so many. I think the Rangers one got canceled. Did it get canceled or is it just being reworked? I heard I. I don't know. I, I Last thing I heard about it, it got canceled because, obviously, they fired uh, Gina mm -hmm. Carano. And she was going to be a big character right. in that. So uh, I don't know. But um, I will agree with you there. Um, a lot of these Star Wars shows that they've announced, I'm not particularly excited for because they feel so so random and nitpicked yeah. and also unnecessary. I feel like, you know, I'd be much happier if they took all of these, these shows, threw them away, and then also just focused on, you know, making The Mandalorian and making the Book of Boba Fett, and making Ahsoka, and making the Kenobi show, and making all of these four or five shows yeah, cause, cause top I, tier, I, and stop focusing on characters that never really mattered in the Because I feel place. like the concept for a lot of these spinoff shows could just be like maybe one or two episodes in like a Bad Batch show, or like a wonder, or maybe like part of a segment in a Mandalorian episode. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, I get what you mean. Um, yeah, because... Yeah, this is especially especially a uh, weird time for Star Wars because like both concurrent action, both live action TV shows and both cartoons are considered canon, and like um, it's it's I feel like if you're because obviously for us being long time fans, it's easy for us to keep track because this is new media for us. But like, imagine in yeah. like five years from now, you want. Uh, you're five five years from now. You're a little kid. You want to get into Star Wars, okay? So you, you watch the original movies. You watch the uh, sequel tr trilogy, which might get a proper name by by that time around. But you know what I mean. 
you watch all three sets of movies, where do you go from there? You have so many TV shows and comics and video games that you need to catch up on to understand the full scope of the story. Because, like, imagine, like, whatever TV show comes out from now, a, a new Star Wars show, and they reference something that happened season three, episode five of The Clone Wars. You know, I'm just naming something off the top of my head randomly. And, like, um, unless you yeah. see that particular piece of media, you're not going to get the fan feedback you want from it, and you're just going to leave the new fan base really confused. I, I agree that, like, you know, it's, it's going to get very convoluted um, with, you know, lore and story and stuff, and that's why I feel like they, they need to chuck things out, like the Lando show and the, the Cassian Ando show yeah. and stuff. It's just unnecessary, really. Um, but I will say, you know, if, if any Star Wars fans that aren't Star Wars fans yet want a place to start, start with either the prequels or the original trilogy, then move to the sequels if you want mm -hmm. to. Um, and then go to the animated shows. Maybe even go to the Mandalorian. I heard Resistance you know. being a really bad show. Was that, was that just false memory? Yeah, skip that one. Because <laughs> like the art style one. was so weird. Because like, I, I, I'm not saying they can't introduce new art styles to the shows, especially if they want to make something different. But like, in terms yeah. of like canon Star Wars TV shows, I think everyone got used to the Clone Wars art style. You know. Yeah, which is why I think the Bad Batch did so great, mm. in the way it looks at mm -hmm. least. Um, but, dude, the Resistance style, style is almost as it, it is as bad as Marvel's yeah, water. Is it the I same studio? Is, I feel style. like it's the same studio. Probably. Um, now, um, to get I don't know how much of What If you've watched, but to get into that a bit, I mean, it's not terrible. It's basically like. Yeah, I liked a lot of the ideas. Like, the first episode with uh, Captain Carter, I actually really enjoyed. Um, but the one oh, afterwards yeah. where it's like, you know, Thanos, who's a part of the Ravages now, yeah. and it was just so fucking cringe, dude. Yeah, I like... Uh, there was one about the, the Ant-Man becoming the Yellow Jacket. That seems like an interesting premise. I'll probably go and watch that episode. But I'm really not too fussed about the show. A lot of the Marvel shows that are coming out, I'm really not first about. I, I, I wasn't a particularly big fan of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I didn't like One hmm. Division at yeah. all. Uh, so yeah, maybe those those are hot takes to Marvel um, fans, but yeah. You see, that's I how hate because like the quartering has made it like really cringe to talk about this because all he does is fucking bitch uh, about. I fucking uh, hate the because all, all he does is like <laughs> he bitches about the show like bro Brie Larson did this uh. by the way I, I do I do not like Brie Larson as an actor I can't really say much as a oh, I, I, I don't like her I, fi I find her uh, sorry to interrupt but I, I find her insufferable yeah, but, like, um, and I also find the movie Captain Marvel atrocious he, as well uh, I do not like that movie at all it gets really yeah but like when you start making like what is it like 25 videos on her like i'm i'll i'll start batting her in her corner at that point jesus yeah i do the quartering is the, the prime example of like when it's it's what i i suppose you could call counter cringe mm -hmm. it's it's cringe but trying to take the piss yeah. out of cringe I suppose that's the only way I can really find a way to uh, to speak about it. You were meant it. to destroy. Um, you you were meant to destroy them, not become one of them. <laughs> you were meant to destroy the cringe, not join it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 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 yeah, like the, I I feel like part of the problem with okay, so like let's take an aspect that I I, I thought they did a really good uh, correction on in episode one of What If, like they gave they gave um. Agent Carter, the buff, the buff muscles, which you're supposed to do because it's a super soldier f f formula. But the main bad guy, yeah. or like, I'm sorry, our main antagonist, because she's not a bad person per se. But like, our main antagonist in uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier is a scrawny ginger woman, who, granted, probably could beat me up. But like in the context of the show, who she apparently in it, her character in the show has taken the uh, the super soldier s serum, who 
you know, and Captain America made this scrawny, like, push him over and all, his, all of his bones break guy go to a literal beefcake. So, like, yeah, uh, I suppose I, I get what you mean, but at the same time, it was explained in the I, show, I, though it was kind of a I, mad. I, I know, I know, but literally. like they could have very easily have hired like a UFC, uh, a UFC fighter for that role. I'm just saying. Fire, uh, yeah, yeah, hire a a uh, a you know. A ginger UFC <laughs> who's really buff. I, I feel like we're checklisting someone's like fetish. <laughs> Good fucking lord. Muscular woman. Oh my ginger. god. <laughs> Number fifteen. Rethinking the antagonists oh, no. of the Falcon and the Winter oh, Soldier no. to fit people's fetishes. You, you, you say that too well. You say that too well. <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, WandaVision was a nice uh, concept, more of anything. And then I, I like Loki the was more of like exploration of, because this new phase of Marvel is exploring the multiverse. So like, that's a good way of yeah. like introducing that concept to your viewers along with the What If Loki series, because that's confirmed to be um, multiple universes. Yeah, uh, Loki's one I actually forgot about uh, to mention before. I actually really enjoyed mm -hmm. Loki. Um, I love this whole thought of, you know, bringing Kang the Conqueror, who's like Thanos, but ten times more powerful. I, I like the idea of bringing him as a villain back into, uh, into yeah, MCU. Yeah, yeah, so like... And then... Because th this, this is my main thing. Like, you, you've been setting up Thanos for three phases so like who who's next afterwards you know yeah I, I think that's something that the comics kind of did they had multiple different bad guys there like Thanos who was like the main big bad you had uh, Kang the Conqueror and you had all these little minions of Thanos's mm -hmm. um, but yeah I, I think having Kang the Conqueror uh, as a villain would be and then the very Eternals. Cool. I'm really. If I remember right, the Eternals is is um, they're hinting at Galactus. Galactus. Oh yeah. boy, that Which, will be something. I, at some point, they have to introduce at least Wolverine into the MCU, correct? It's yeah. And so uh, like, um, it, this is going to be a very interesting thing because like in like the regular comic universe of Marvel, mutants have always been there. Because, like, it's it's the next stage of human evolution. So, like, them trying to explain something that's just been there genetically the whole time, it's just go it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I I'll agree, though. And I'm, I'm super looking forward to any and all ideas they come up with <laughs> and whether they're executed the right MCU or wrong. The MCU X-Men film is going to include women, the quartering? <laughs> I, I, I know he's I, I, I know he's not actually sexist but like it, 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 it is come on bro it's a little bit it, sussy it, it, it is it's, it's very cringe I, I I know his his argument is oh it's just easy content for me which I mean like okay you do you at that point but like c c come on dude come on <laughs> like yeah. like you make <laughs> our, like you make actual criticisms of like the the Star Wars trilogy, like the Star Wars films and like MCU films, be almost look un unimportant because you're just like complaining about little stuff so much. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. nitpicky. I'll, uh, I'll I'll definitely agree there. And um, and it's a uh, it's something that he, I I just hope that he, he stops doing. It, it's it, it it reminds me the quartering is kind of like a dilute version, uh, who also like dilute version minus the fake news of people like mm -hmm. Mike Zero and Doomcock. Like, those guys are fucking terrible. I mm -hmm. fucking hate them. Um, the, the new film that just came out, uh, Sang Chi and the uh, Legend of the Ten Rings, looks really cool. And yeah. like, oh, by the way, my favorite, my, other than horror, one of, some of my favorite B-movies are, like, martial arts films. And like, it's really cool yeah. seeing a, a martial arts film in, um, this day and age, I mean, I know a lot of it's CGI, but you get what, you get what I mean. 
Yeah, um, I get what you mean. And like, it's just, uh, uh, from what I hear, they have actually, it, they don't like put like the representation in your face like they do with like Captain Marvel. Like, it's just like, here's yeah. a character who's just really cool, who happens to be of this, you know, background. Yeah, I, I mean, with Captain Marvel, I wouldn't even say the whole, the whole women empowerment thing was what made me cringe. It was like the end scene. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, with the fighting and everything, it, it just made mm -hmm. me cringe. With the, the dialogue was awful. The the credits were terrible. The song I played I, was I, even I get worse. that it was the it was the the next film that came out right after his death. But I really wish like the the the, the uh, in memory of Stan Lee tribute would have been like at the uh, end of Endgame. Yes, it would have been much more fitting if it was after um, much at the more end of poignant. Endgame, at least. And like, I, I, I yeah. don't think this is true, but like, I always heard rumors that like, uh, there was actually like a planned like message that he would say at the end of Endgame, where he's like thanking everyone for supporting the MCU. That would oh, be and really like, nice. uh, I was talking to some friends, and we thought of like a really cool like alternate cameo they could have had for uh, Endgame. So the scene is at Iron Man's funeral, and uh, everyone, you know, is giving uh, is everyone is uh, talking about Tony, and then you have a uh, you have Stan Lee there in the distance, and like uh, someone goes up to him and asks him like, uh, "Do you know Tony at all?" And he go and, and like he would say something along the lines of, "No, but I've watched him grow," and then just walks off, and then like yeah. you know it, uh, the other characters are confused. That would be that would be kind of sweet. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, uh, to to talk about Stan Lee a bit, like the dude is he was such an awesome guy. Lo loved really all was. the fans and kept working on stuff up to his death. Like he wasn't like a main creator anymore, but he was like working on like producer stuff. He was very much invested in the MCU as we knew it mm -hmm. in the twenty tens, and. Um, he was always supportive of um, everybody. He, he he didn't need feel the need to you know force certain things into different movies, you know, uh, just to to come off righteous or anything. He did it to give people you know something to look up to and also tell an interesting yeah. story at the same time. And he succeeded. Which um, I'm about to say something that my friends have heavily disagreed with me with. I think Captain America is a better representation of what a hero should be rather than Superman. I kind of agree. I, I think, honestly, if I could pick any hero, probably uh, the Winter Soldier or Falcon, because the Winter Soldier shows that no matter, you know, what bad shit you go through or what bad shit you do, there's mm -hmm. always a way back, whether that be, you know, through therapy or... Um, just doing good shit to, to try and you know get back. Yeah, and, um, and like the thing the thing the thing is with uh, c comparing Captain America with Superman. Yeah, it's easy for Superman to like spout these um, these, these messages and always um, and always making sure not to harm innocent people. But like he has the literal powers of a god. And but but like yeah. Steve, while he has super strength, super reflexes, at the end of the day, a bullet can kill him, just like anyone else. And that but that didn't stop him from being the first to run to help someone, to always try to find um, different ways of handling things to make sure the best outcome was possible. When I I, I when his arm's that. broken. In end, his arm is broken in Endgame. His two strongest allies are down for the count. Hulk is injured. <laughs> um, Hulk is injured. Hawkeye is nowhere to be seen. He doesn't care. He gets up, gets ready to fight again, and he was willing to like to uh, go out right there fighting Thanos, not giving him uh, the stones back without a fight. I think yeah. that just shows a lot about his character. And it shows, you know, every hero 
Um, and every person really has a weakness. And, you know, Captain America's was just like everybody else's, you know, getting yeah. shot. And it didn't stop him at the end of the day. And I, I think that makes for a, an interesting hero, especially Although in the MCU. I, 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 it would have been cool if they did reference the I could do I could do this all day line. Yeah, that would yeah, be like funny. He, like after like that you know that that um that initial like pain he got from like tightening up the shield so that way he could fight with his broken arm. Like that would have been just so cool for him to go. I can do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> it would be pretty. It, it'd be a a nice little callback, mm -hmm. I suppose, um, to to back when. You know, he, he was in the, the back alley in Brooklyn getting his ass beat yeah. by those guys. And then Bucky came mm -hmm. along. I mean, I, I get they already did the reference in uh, Captain America 3, which, you know, was his last film. Technically, at, his, his last standalone film as Captain America, but it still yeah. would have been cool. Also, too... I mean, even then, the, the Captain America films were more Avengers than anything. Uh, I, I, so, I don't really like what they did with Steve at the end. Cause like his whole character arc of that point was accepting the fact that things happened and to move on and then like just to have that reversed and be like oh yeah by the way he was actually able to uh spend the rest of his life with carter you know i mean like I, yeah I, I, I mean i i liked it because it it, it kind of you know he, he spent all that time getting over it but then realized he had a chance to go back and uh he did so uh, I, I'm fine with it, but I can see why people. Yeah, have I think it would have been. I, I think it would have been a, be a better character moment if like he didn't do that. I think they should have found a way for him to die along with um, Iron Man. Like, imagine. I, I don't know how they. Were, I'm just working this off the top of my head. But imagine if if there were if there had to be a way to where it had to be both uh, Tony and Steve. To like work the gauntlet to um, uh, defeat Thanos, and that's how they both die. And like it would, it would be a yeah. way for them to like everything to come full cir circle of them being teammates, then enemies, and then them finally learning to work together again. Yeah, because I, I I did like the conflict between Captain America and Iron Man. That that was something that I. I definitely thought was interesting. I didn't like Civil War the first time I saw it, but oh, then it, it kind of grew on me, especially when I started to notice the little details. Let me tell you, the, you know? uh, as someone who read the original comic book event, uh, the movie is much better than the comics. I will really? 100%, 100%, because in the movie, the issue isn't necessarily the, 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 the Hero Registration Act, it's Bucky. Bucky's the main source of conflict, and with yeah. the the event, it that is the main source of conflict. It's the registration, and the the way the escalation of everything was very dumb. Because in actuality, uh, Captain America had no intention of starting anything. He was actually willingly going with the registration act, which, by the way, in comics isn't what you think it was it wasn't allowing the public to know who you are it's literally just shield needs to know your identity which by yeah. the way the majority of heroes shield knew about shield kept tabs yeah i mean i mean shield already knew that yeah you know, tony stark was iron Man. i mean they knew about everyone so like um Cause like, the, like, cause like, they make it sound like, oh yeah, it's the public. No, but no, it's the government. But no, it's a it's actually Shield. Like, like it, it's Shield who has to know. But like, Shield has a date a, a database of hundreds of heroes. So like, they know who the majority of these guys yeah. are already. So then that's a massive hole. In yeah. The well, and plus comic. two. So do you want to know what started the Civil War in the first place? Uh, so, what was it? Um. At that point in the comics, Nick Fury was gone. I forget for what specific reason, but basically he wasn't in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D. So, like, the head lady in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D., like, for some reason, just has, like, a riot squad surrounding Captain America. And she goes, uh, are mm -hmm. you going to take down uh, the heroes who don't comply with the act? And he goes, while I, agree with, while I disagree with the act, I will 
uh, obey it, but I will not. Fu- I will not take down heroes who are trying to do what they think is right. And then she tries gunning him down. Like <gasps> that's a bit weird. Exactly, and like the the next event was secret invasion, and I thought they were gonna do a thing. Like I thought, like a clever rewrite would have been, oh, she was actually a scroll a scroll the entire time, and she was just trying to eliminate Captain America because she knew how much of a, th- of a threat he was. But no, she was a human the entire time. So she knowingly attacked someone yeah. who said yet yeah, that yes, they would comply with the law. They would just not be taking down people who wouldn't. Yeah, that that's odd. literally that's that's so, that's what started the event. And so like it, that, if it wasn't for that, Cap would have complied with everything. But like the story is written to make Captain Captain America's side purposefully wrong. And yeah. In um in, in the movie, while Cap- while yes, Captain America wins in the end and uh, well, sort of wins. Uh, there's a lot more nuance in the film about each side's position. Um, we in the comic, it's it's even though at first it's portrayed as like who could win, you know, but it, it was very deliberately written to where Iron Man was right, and a lot of writers were actually very very upset with that. So the following storylines that would precede it, they would find every excuse to, to get Tony beaten to a pulp. So yeah. a, a good example of this is the uh, World War Hulk comic book event, because um, there's there's a scene where Hulk like just collapses a building on Tony and proceeds to beat the ever loving crap out of him until he rips him out of the armor. Jesus, that I, that sounds quite cool, but like, that's a bit of a <laughs> well, well, I mean, Hulk was kind of ju- well, in from Hulk's perspective at the time in that story, he was kind of justified because um, I don't know, I don't know if you read Planet Hulk or not, but that was basically the explanation of why Hulk wasn't in Civil War because in in the comics anyway, because if Hulk was involved, obviously he would have chosen Cap's side, and a side that has the Hulk is going to do going to do significant damage. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I liked uh, the way that um, I believe it was in Age of Ultron in the movies, at least um, when Hulk got sent off yeah. in that plane. I, I thought that was a, a cool way to kind of distance himself from the next movie. Uh, I, I, I like that because it um, opened up definitely that connection between not only Bruce and Natasha, but Hulk yeah, and which Natasha, by the way you know? went nowhere in and, the end because like they're next because like they they see each other in, in Infinity War and just kind of like. Hi. Yeah, it's. Did, I, I did, don't like the did, way it was handled. It dude, could have been dude, so much better. I, I, I might have been reading too much into this, but like, did, in in Endgame, did you get like romantic vibes from like Hawkeye, Scarlet Witch? Was that just me? Was I reading too much into that? Probably. I I I saw it more um, Hawkeye and Black Widow. Really, I, I was getting more vibes from them. Okay. Uh, I, Scarlet Witch. Uh, Wait, did I say Scarlet? I, I, did I say thought, Scarlet Witch know. by accident. I meant. Um, I meant. Yeah. I meant. I meant Black uh, Widow. Wanda. I meant you Black Widow. Sorry. Oh, Black Widow. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that. Yeah. Um. Um. And another another thing too is. So I, I think they they are gonna do an Avengers five. I think I think that without a doubt question is what the story is going to be i think like the main point is going to be like the the old avengers are going to be like mentoring the new ones something like that i mean it's it's hard to say who we'll see Uh, return and who we won't i i know we might not see or at least because like the new thought by the way can i just uh, i i need to complain a bit okay so like um yeah go on jane foster was the love interest in the first one, and she's been gone yeah. since that movie. Uh, uh, d- yeah, she she literally disappeared. She, like I was like, dude, yeah. where the fuck is Natalie Portman? She well, was like my well, childhood well, like, crush, they bro. And I still got the feel. Well, like, the where thing is, she is going? I I don't get why they didn't do what they did with uh, the original actor for War Machine. Like they could have just easily replaced them and not and not said anything. 
They did that with the Hulk, but they, for some reason they didn't, they, they, they couldn't do that with Jane Foster. Um, so like, yeah. you have a character who's going to be the new Thor in the movies. And like in the comics, I, 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 I didn't agree with the decision to make her the new Thor. But like you could argue that it, it's it's a it's a better choice because she's always been a supporting character for Thor. She, she's always been at his side. It, it, in the context of the movie, she's been gone for a very long time. Didn't she show up in like I believe it was Ragnarok? Did she? For like a brief moment, I I I, I recall Natalie Portman showing up in one of the more recent movies. I don't remember. It might have been Endgame or Infinity War. I don't think. Uh, l- let me search yeah, this up. Like, well, my, my point is, you have a character who hasn't been in a supporting role, or at least like a, um, a very important one for quite a while, and like they're supposed to be the new, uh, new superhero. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I believe she was in Endgame. Was she yeah, in Endgame? Uh, I was right there. I think so. Because they had to go back in time, right? Well, I remember Thor's mother being in Endgame because of the time travel scene. It's, it's Yeah, it's been a while since I watched many of the uh, the Marvel movies, but I do remember she was in one of the more recent ones. It was either Ragnarok, Infinity War, okay. or Endgame. It was one of those three. Um, By the way, I think... My most anticipated movie is going to be Spider-Man: No Way Home. That looks dude, amazing, dude. We might, uh, we might get um, Tobey Maguire, Maguire back. That's going to be awesome. Uh, okay, Andrew Garfield fans. I hope, I hope he embraces like a shit ton of the memes oh, yeah. that have been made over the last ten or so years. Like it's pizza <laughs> time and shit. I, um, <laughs> I hope he says that. that I, I, I will say that Andrew Garfield is. He makes a good Spider-Man, but not necessarily, like, in my opinion, he didn't really make a good Peter. At least, uh, not a good Peter in high school setting. Yeah. Like, I, like now that he's older, I, you can definitely say that he fits, like, the, uh, he's, like, the middle, because, like, he's the middle of the road, uh, in terms of, like, the story. He's the middle of the road Spider-Man. Like, he has some experience under his belt, but he's not, like, he's not really wise in it, like, um, like, like, Toby's it. Toby Spider-Man is, you know? Yeah, yeah, I got what you mean. Um, like, I didn't really watch many of the original movies. I've watched the ones with uh, Toby Maguire, and I've watched the ones with um, of yes. Tom Holland, who I, I think fits the role quite nicely if he wasn't Br- British. British! But, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, like, the pro- probably the problem with the Amazing Spider-Man movies was... They were they were literally made because they were about to run out of the license, and like they needed to make um, a movie in order to renew it. Yeah. Um, so like, there's a lot of there's like a rush job sort of feel there, and um, have oh, wait I wonder because like because like I I've seen like some teaser images of like Electro. Do you think the do you think uh, the lizard's gonna be in, in this one? It hasn't. I don't know. I mean, we know that fucking uh, robot arm octopus. Doc Doc Ock. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna be in. Hello, that. Peter. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know about anybody else. I would, ar- uh, uh, I would argue that uh, Spider-Man Two is actually the quintessential like superhero movie. Yeah. It, like, I mean, I can't really remember it that well. I watched it. Uh, when I was a kid, I've but, watched it like multiple yeah. times. Cause like. It's a story of Peter having basically everything at that point. Other than, like, crooks here and there, he's dealing with no major bad guys at all. His, he, uh, his life, other than, like, um, with MJ, like, his life is actually going pr- fairly decently at this point. People adore Spider-Man, and all of a sudden he loses his powers. And the the, the, the journey in that movie is... is basically Peter realizing that it's not the powers that made him Spider-Man it's him like uh, he's he is Spider-Man he, he, I know that sound might, might not I'm not I'm probably not expl- explaining it the best way but but it's what I'm, what I'm saying is like 
the purpose of it is to show that Peter is is more than just um, a guy with superpowers. He's a genuinely good person who wants to help out people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd agree and um, so like obviously like uh, the main actor for Doc Ock looks looks a bit different than uh, how he looks in the original movie. The theory. Yeah, he, there, there are noticeable changes. The theory obviously. is that this Doc Ock, while technically the same same Doc Ock from Spider-Man Two, is a different version. And what? So like a multiverse? Yeah. Version? So like the theory is that he's a Doc Ock who managed to succeed in killing uh, Spider-Man. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the going theory for uh, the rest of the villains too. Like they're basically, they're basically multiverse versions of the Sinister Six who managed to complete um, their individual plans in the movies. I know. Yeah. Oh, that's that's actually quite an interesting uh, thing, though. I, I yeah, because I, I know, like the the I think everyone is just going for oh, these are the, just them plucked out right before they died, you know, which really doesn't work for William Defoe's character because obviously, like I know they can, they can they can change how old he looks in the movie thanks to CGI and really good makeup, but like obviously, like he's gonna look a bit older, you know. No no offense to William Defoe because like. I mean, he looks very different than he d- than he did, you know, 20 years ago. Um, the Doc Ock yeah. actor still looks in really good shape, but like, you know, <laughs> there's still a very telling difference. And then, and then, like yeah. the images I've seen of Electro, I don't know if they're real or not, but it's basically Electro uh, in the suit rather than pure energy. Hmm. So like uh, you, uh, so like my, so like if if those images are true, then it's a version of Electro who managed to control his powers. That's interesting. Mm. I like that. But yeah, I'm just really excited for what they're gonna do with the movie. And like, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but there are hints that like Daredevil is gonna be in the film too. Cause there, that would be yeah, cause there's weird. that scene of uh, Peter in like the questioning room. And like right before they cut from that, there's like um, there's a guy in a suit like slamming some papers down. The theory is that that's uh, that's Matt. Um, what, am I pronouncing the character's name right? Matt Murdock. That yeah, that's Daredevil's um, identity. That Matt has been assigned to be Peter's lawyer, which would make yeah. a lot of sense to reintroduce the character, because like out of all like the Netflix shows, Daredevil was most liked. So it's a very easy way of like reintroducing the character in the MC back into the MCU. Yes, um, I, I suppose you could say it's kind of like you know what the Mandalorian did going back to Star Wars a bit um, with the Dark Troopers. Yeah, kind yeah. Of, you know, making them canon now. I thought that was really nice, by the way. Um, however. One concern I have going forward is that the Dark Troopers are going to kind of replace or kind of, uh, I, I suppose, take the position of the Death Troopers, which I hope mm-hmm. doesn't happen. Because, um, like, you know, I, I'd like the Dark Troopers to be like this this, this indestructible or near indestructible force. That, that only um, Luke could take down. <laughs> rec- either that or, like, you know, uh, we saw Din Djarin have a bit of a tussle with one that have very specific weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, so are deployed very sparingly, especially after Luke Skywalker just decimated an entire platoon. Yeah. So the Empire probably doesn't have many left. Um, I'd like to see them as uh, kind of a the super soldier of the Empire, yeah. if you get what I mean. Like the super the super robot, the super <laughs> yeah. battle droid. I, I, I really um, like how... And I'd like to see the Death Troopers as like the elite squads. I really like you know? how uh, the Mandalorian establishes, yes, yes, while the Republic has technically formed, the Empire was so vast and strong that there are still remnants of them left, but they're basically like border borderline warlords. Yeah, um, obviously we had that, that unnamed character who was a, an Imperial warlord trying to get Grogu, and then we have uh, Moff Gideon who's literally an, an Imperial mm-hmm. Moff, so 
and it was an ISB at some point, so obviously he's ranked mm -hmm. up. And I, I, I think the Empire are a lot more, um, a lot more organized than the Mandalorian lets on. Um, I think they're a lot larger of a force, and I still think, um, I theorize they still have a hold mm -hmm. over Mandalore. And I think Mandalore is going to be one of the main focal points of, you know, bringing the First Order into the, uh, into uh, the scene. Can, can we, speaking of, can we talk because about the First Order a bit? I, personally, personally, I think they're kind of lame. I like, yeah, I like the sure. suit design because, like, I, oh yeah, it's a, it's an evolution of the old Stormtrooper outfit, which I actually kind of like. But like them as a concept, I think is really lame. Very. Uh, they don't, yeah, uh, they they don't work as well. Um, in the uh, in, in the sequel trilogy just alone mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like you know uh, with the Phasma book that's an interesting take on the First Order I, I enjoyed reading that um, and I, I like the way that the Mandalorian seems to be hinting at the, the you know the future of the Empire and how it may form into the First mm -hmm. Order and I'm hoping they, they, they do kind of clear that up and one thing I don't like about the First Order is how that the the Sith Eternal or whatever they called it, you know, the, the, the final yeah. order or whatever with the Sith Troopers, like how that was somehow unbeen, un, unknown yeah. or something at the First Order, like they didn't know about this or something. It's it's really weird and I I, I do not like Episode Nine for that. It's it's, it's so... The, the idea is there, but it's, it's so all over the place. I don't know what J.J. Abrams or anybody who was working on the sequels was Dude, saying. dude, listening to him like talk about his writing development is super like weird like when you start listening to how he thinks as a writer you start to realize why the the star trek films that he made and the star the star wars films that he was involved with suck so much yeah uh, he's got a weird writing style um i think one of my main criticisms is he has so many different ideas and then fails to to fully flesh them out finish them or mm -hmm. execute them um, one of these was Finn. Oh, Finn was Finn's such an interesting character. Like, and they fucked him up so you bad. You have this character who was Spartan raised to be a First Order trooper, and then finally breaking away from that. And like, you could have so many scenes of him like trying to like do stuff that we would consider like normal, like in the Star Wars universe, but like being in amazement of it. Uh, essentially, he could have been our, like, eyes into this new era of Star Wars. Like, this new uh, timeline. Or not timeline, but you get what I mean. Like, this advancement. Um, yeah. That's why I think he he could have worked so well as the main character. Because you have a unique backstory with him. Um, you um, you still, like, in, in terms of, like, the social justice aspect, you still get brownie points because it would technically be the, the first time... Um, and a black person was like a main focal point in Star Wars besides Lando. I mean, and Mace Windu, but you get what I mean. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even say Mace and Lando were, were very uh, main or influential characters. Lando more than Mace, mm -hmm. definitely, but they, they weren't like the, the main focal point of the, the, the first two Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, and trilogies. like, what was weird was like a lot of like the marketing was Finn with the lightsaber. I think they were trying to like have it so. It's a gotcha. I suppose kind kind of like uh yeah kind of like what, I I, I think Kotor might have done something like this with with Revan, um where you know it's like oh there's this big you know Sith Lord out there somewhere named Darth Revan and it turns out you're Revan and then they try to do the same thing with with Finn and Rey but it's like oh she's the Jedi. He's not. Yeah, which... When in reality, I, I think a, a more interesting way of going about this was to make them both yeah, Jedi. Uh, can I? I really hate how like they went about showing how she was force sensitive. It was based. What you? Oh, you're you're a Palpatine. No, 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 no. Mm. Like um, like like the, uh, when Kylo Ren is like force interrogating her, and like she forces it back on him, like. Luke couldn't do that when he first found out he was force sensitive at all. Like, that's another thing. Training. There, there was little to no training. She was basically the, the, she was a little def the literal definition of a yeah, because like she could magically fly the ship, and like because like 
like you introduce that she is actually like a crack shot pilot and like I get like they say oh yeah I've never done that before and you know I know people actually perform really well in certain tasks and like an under high stress situations but like flying it to the point where Finn with a broken turret could take out two TIE fighters with no like with little to no problem is and like what is it she I remember she actually fixed the Millennium Falcon in episode 7 which Han wasn't able to do since the beginning of episode 4 which is super weird like she she just they, they basically portrayed her and written her like to be this this miracle yeah. woman and it came off uh, like not only as a big spit in the face to characters like Luke Skywalker but um was also very very I suppose the only word I can really think of is mm -hmm. cringe because it, it just made me cringe too much. Yeah, times. and like, and, um, like the, the scene, like, she over like powers him with the force. And like, uh, that's something like, I don't like as well. She she should have well, been defeated. Uh, by like, in, Kylo the, in, Ren. in the interrogation scene, they should have had it to where, like, she was able to resist him with the mind tricks at least, you know? And then, like, maybe, yeah, like, yeah. you have Kylo, like, questioning afterwards. Like, don't have him directly say it. Just, like, have him question it afterwards. Like, hmm, interesting. You know, something like that. And that then, would have been cool. I, I would have like, liked that. So my problem is, okay, so, like, you have a scene where he just completely decimates Finn. Someone with, with, with years of training in combat. Granted, he wasn't trained with a lightsaber, but still years of like training with hand-to-hand -hand combat rifle fire that kind of stuff and like he gets and rightfully yeah. so he gets completely decimated by kylo ren which he should by the way i think i think that that was a perfectly good way of of showing kylo's level as a threat just like so casually just like taking out someone who would if would be on like captain phasma's level of like skill you know I'd say a little below but Plasma, you, but you, yeah, you get I what I mean, that. though. Like in terms of like, yeah, Finn I get the picture. Finn is yeah. peak human uh, performance in the Star Wars universe without the Force. Yeah, I, and I'd so agree with that. you would think like something maybe not as brutal, but something similar were to happen with Rey, but like she actually like the Earth, like the planet itself, has to save Kylo from her. Yeah, it's, uh... Because, mm. like, like she could have... She was about to win in, like, two swipes. Yeah. I, th I think, to be honest, I, I would have liked to say if, if um, Rey was beaten down in combat and Kylo Ren was about to strike and her down. The planet, and then the planet splits. And then... Not only that, but I, f I feel like uh, Kylo Ren should get distracted by, like, Finn shooting yeah, out maybe like something. maybe maybe like and Finn then, like you know in his last ounce of strength he like um tries to shoot at him and like obviously Kylo knows about this so he, he um he force stops the um the the, uh, the blast and then the planet splits you know yeah that would have been interesting I but no liked like the, the the literal plot had to go in and save Kylo from, from her it's a uh, yeah it's it's a mess like I've seen a lot of people praise Kylo Ren oh, dude, dude. Um, as one of the better written uh, characters. I, 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 I heavily I disagree. Don't see like it. I actually really I, I like the I actor disagree. who plays him a lot. The dude seems actually really cool. But like yeah, Adam yeah, Drive is like, cool. The, the the writing for his character makes him a pompous like wannabe so much. The the, the script writing for Kylo Ren is almost as atrocious as the prequel trilogy like, did with I, Anakin. I, I remember like bringing say. up my grievances in um a discord server which was related to movies and like someone brought up some artwork and like someone said that he was their favorite character and i said i heavily disagree because of, of how he was written but then they go oh but he had a cool sword 
Yeah, true, but like, looks can be deceiving. A character can look cool, but still be a poorly written yeah. character, you know? Um, Captain Phasma is no stranger to that. Like, Captain Phasma is probably my favorite character of the sequels. And I feel like that character was heavily mismanaged, mm -hmm. and you have to read a book it, to yeah, understand. Yeah, which is weird. You know? Because, like, uh, cause, like yeah. you have, like, this interesting point in The Last Jedi where it actually shows that she's kind of a coward. And, like, you have, you have that moment yeah, where, um, like, the Stormtroopers are, like, kind of agreeing with Finn. And so, but, like, it, yeah, she like, that, like, what Captain Phasma should have been Finn's Darth Vader. Like, if you weren't going to make him a Force user, that should have been his Darth Vader, you know what I mean? So, like, in, an easy yeah, progression yeah. of the films would have been, instead of, like, just immediately capturing her, what, they, what it should have been was Captain Phasma and Finn have a fight um, Captain Phasma completely like wrecks him, and Han and Chewie have to save him, you know. And then in the Last Jedi, you have it to where they're on more equal footing, but then something happens to where they can't finish the fight. And then the last film um, is where they find they find Rise of the Skywalkers is where they finally end it all, you know. Yeah. But, but no, yeah. It just that wasn't how it worked, cause. We have to give Finn a new love interest every movie because we have to hint at it to be Rey, but then we also have to hint at it to be this random Asian character, and then like, oh, we'll finally give him this black lady. Yeah, it's uh, it ain't it ain't. Like, why uh, did why did uh, Finn did. have to have a love a love interest? That's a thing. Why did he have to have it? Yeah, that, that's 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 the thing as well. Like, it, it feels like every single Star Wars sequel prequel original trilogy like everything really um has always had a love interest and i feel like it's only the the the, the spin-off shows that we've never really seen that you know there was a hint at one with din and that that one weird lady who can shoot very very well in that fishing village mm -hmm. um but that was all we got in the mandalorian and i think it would have been interesting to see what would happen if he had went with that woman and maybe he'll go back to her in season three but, um, yeah, I, I feel like that that, that yeah. was very much an unnecessary uh, relationship mm -hmm. uh, obsession in the sequels. And I feel like it could have worked better if people were more cautious of Finn uh, because he was an ex yeah, trooper, you know, yeah. they're, they're scared he might rat them out. And it slowly or, kind of builds up to a great friendship, or possibly even a relationship. I th I think uh, that would be a much better. Another way to thing too is like that. maybe have it to where like the like you could actually have like the clone commands come back in a way, but have it to where they mind control. They basically brainwash the kids to where if they said a certain phrase, it would activate like a kill code or something. And yeah, so like yeah. you could have like a scene where like. He's fighting back as much as possible, you know, or something along those lines. You get, you get what I mean? Um, yeah, I get what you mean. So, like, yeah, you could definitely like do a lot. There, like, there's just so many different kind of things that you could have done with a character like Finn in a Star Wars setting. And then, like, uh, can I, yeah. I want to talk about Poe for a minute. I feel personally, I feel that Poe was a character designed so that way they could crap on. Han Solo's archetype of a character without directly crapping on Han Solo. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like, see he's what the, you mean. He's the hotshot who um, always tries to get stuff his, done his way, you know? Very much very much like Han. Um, yeah, he's, he's like an arrogant piece of work, Han. Yeah. But like his, in, in his arguments in The Last Jedi make a lot of sense, though. You have this commanding officer who... By the way, does not look like a commanding officer. And no, I'm not saying that because she's a woman or anything. But, like, look at her design. She looks like an ambassador more than she does a commander. Yeah. Yeah, That's and so, like, you have this commander who is constantly, like, shutting you out of everything. Not telling you or your men anything that's going on. And... I can't. I uh, personally, I can't blame his character for trying to do a mutiny. I really can't. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And 
like, I, I, I just feel like his character didn't accomplish a whole lot besides the fact that they basically used him to say miso misogyny bad, you know? When his character wasn't really misogynist, it was just... He had a crap commander. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, I see what, uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. And... I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. But, oh, sorry. Uh, um, but... Uh, it's all it's all good. We're just kind of jumping from place to place, and it's kind of like uh, I, I it, I'm kind of losing my train of thought because it's been ages since I watched The Force mm -hmm. Awakens or like any of the the sequels, so I can't really remember them that well. But I do kind of agree with a lot yeah, of your arguments. Yeah. Um. But, but yeah, I, I'm hoping that Star Wars material in the future is much better written. I remember what was it? They they actually um. Well, because like there's this weird like little civil war kind of going on in Lucas films right now because you have like the guys responsible for like Mandalorian and uh, uh, Bad Batch basically the good reason stuff on one side and then you have like the ones responsible for like the sequel trilogy and like all like the um, wokeness stuff on the other and it feels like they're trying to fight for control of uh, the, the IP right now and I, th I think the whole civil war thing is a rumor that was spun up by people like Mike Zero and Doomcock. I don't think there's a civil war going on. I feel like it's just they they've got talented writers like Dave <laughs> Filoni and uh, John Favreau working on amazing shows like The Mandalorian and like uh, The Bad Batch and The Clone Wars, and they had a vision for what they wanted the sequels <laughs> to be, but. It was so messy, and there were so many different people changing in and out that the vision was never really fully thought out, and it was executed extremely yeah. poorly. And um, I do feel like we're going to see um, a, a bit of a blend of these two, but hopefully with a lot better writing. And I do think the future of Star Wars, especially after seeing things like The Mandalorian and The Bad Batch, is very promising. Yeah, hopefully they... They hopefully Lucas Films responds better with um, with material for the fans in the in the coming future. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I guess like uh, f some of the final stuff I want to talk about is like you know little bits of uh, YouTube shenanigans here and there. <laughs> oh yes, the tea. Uh, oh, oh no! Oh no! Not the tea! Not the tea! <laughs> no, not the tea channels! No! We, we fucking hate them. Oh, I hate those. I do, too. I do, too. And, like, you can't... Guess what? You can't use the homophobic card on me. Ha-ha. <laughs> but, yeah, they could... Neither can... Ni neither can you me, oh, either, nice. actually. So oh, they can... That's, that's an interesting they can, fact. They can still use, like, the, uh... <laughs> the misogynist and, uh... Um... Uh, racist card on us, though. Or at least for me, anyway. <laughs> based. <laughs> I, I believe the the correct term is based. Based. Actually. Based. Okay, Turkey Tom. <laughs> based on red pill. <laughs> can, can I get a one in the chat, guys? A one in the chat for the baseness. <laughs> one in the chat for the base oh, boys. No. <laughs> oh god! Imagine if like uh, to Tommy C gets that as a sound clip. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> Dude, I slay. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you get pussy? Dude, I slay. That, that was the that was the best Nicholas yeah, Diorio moment I've ever and, seen. Uh, it was too fucking funny. Uh, so, so mm, you know, the funny thing with with uh with Nick is I really like his content, but. Uh, and like I'm not saying I'm trying to, I, I would purposefully like be an asshole to him but I, I feel like eventually like if I were to have a conversation with him or like interact with him eventually we wouldn't get along yeah um, oh, um I feel like Nick is very headstrong in a lot of his oh, yeah. beliefs and um he seems to look down on a lot of the people that um I wouldn't necessarily say his fans, but a lot of the people he interacts with, he looks down on because he sees their uh, their takes as, mm -hmm. as brain dead and shit. I mean, I remember asking him on the stream, like, you know, how to get blocked by Nicholas. Oh, Theorio, dude, dude, I was there list. for that. I was there for that. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was funny. I, I like that he he has a no like a zero tolerance policy to people who are like, "Hey, can you fill me in yeah. on this?" Like because I hate those types of mm -hmm. people as well. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I I do kind of see what mm -hmm. you mean there. But I also feel like he could also be. Oh yeah, like I'm not, so. to be clear, I'm not trying to say that I'm I would on purposefully like antagonize him or anything. It's it's just one of those oh, things of course, where yeah. it's like you get like a feel for someone and like you think, oh, I might not get along 100% with them, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, I've got the same... Ooh, excuse me. Um, I've got the same kind of feeling about Flamenco. Of, uh, oh, 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 I love Flamenco so much. Like the... I, uh, I, I gotta disagree oh, with okay. you. That I, I see a lot of Flamenco's takes as totally fucking brain dead and on top of that I, I just don't feel like he adds as much to RFC as a lot of the other oh, okay. people do like people who aren't connected to it you know like um, Nick Turkey mm -hmm. Tom um, Bo Blacks like a lot of these different people bring something to the table that makes the show mm -hmm. entertaining but Flamenco just seems like the type of guy who just sits there and gives an idiotic take and then everybody just likes him because Augie likes him. And oh. yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of him. And I hope he doesn't take offense to that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm per personally, I'm more, I'm, I'm more of a fan of him. Um, um, yeah. One, one, one thing... Um, what, what was that going on with this? Y you know, it's, it's, it's funny because like... I was watching commentary content when like... Since like... Tom started well a little bit after tom started because like i remember mm. watching i this is a video he's taken down um but tom had made this uh video of like why he thinks anime sucks and like as a I fan of that. anime obviously i was watching I, I watched this and like i i i um I could see his point of view, and like, I could be misremembering, but I swear the right opinion made a cameo in this in this uh, video, or at least a video like per mm. preceding it. I, I definitely know like the right opinion made a cameo in some of Nick, uh, not Nick's Tom's earlier content, and so like that's how yeah. I I got introduced to him, and then eventually through the right opinion I got introduced to Jay Aubrey, and. Uh, I think I stopped watching commentary for a little bit, and then I just, eventually I like was discovering guys like Augie, Tommy C, um, Tipster, um, mainly through uh, Craig Beckett, a sm smaller channel. Uh, oh, dude, yeah, I love me, Craig. He's uh, fucking happy. Me too. I mean, we butt heads every now and then, but I, I overall, I overall enjoy enjoy him. Um, because because like I started heavily getting into commentary again, not not as like as as a content creator because I mainly I mainly like a podcaster slash like reviewer because like I'm more in inspired by like yeah. channel awesome type of guys. I just don't want to have their spurgy political beliefs. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But the thing with um, commentary was I started getting back into it because a friend of mine who I, I became friends with through, through his video. Uh, he did a video on the mini lad situation. And so like that kind of like yeah. sparked my interest back into uh, commentary. Cause like, uh, cause I, at that point I was like, oh, well, I mean, like, I don't know, I'm kind of done with this. Cause like, I, I at the time I saw it as like a genre of basically just like self cannibalizing. Because like, if you couldn't, I, I my point of view was if they couldn't create drama, they would create. If they couldn't find drama, they would they would create it with themselves by attacking people who yeah, control yeah. trends and stuff. That, that was that was a very yeah, narrow yeah. mind view I had at the time. Um, mm. And so like I I, I kind of discovered commentary again through my friend who is more of like I don't want to say influencer vlog type because like those are generally associated with more rich creators. But like he kind of has that like that vibe, you know. Kind of. Yeah. Like, yeah, like if he mean. had the resources, he'd be more of like a sideman type of guy. If you if you get what I mean. Yeah, I got um, your flow. But like for because because, because I watched his uh, mini lad video, uh, Craig's mini lad video was recommended to me, so I kind of went down the rabbit hole. 
You could, yeah. you could say I was red pilled. I was I was given the commentary <laughs> red pill. It was at this moment he became <laughs> yes. best. Yes, and then like, <laughs> for me, like commentary has been this thing that has spanned multiple years for uh -huh. me. I, I've always kind of been in the background. I even tried to do a commentary video once, but um, I, I'd say it kind of it it really wasn't very good. Um, not only did I not have the resources at the time to make it good, but I didn't have the talent nor mm -hmm. the experience. Um, but I remember the first type of commentary I watched was one time I got home from school in the very early summer of 2016, and I was watch I was binge watching Leafy, mm -hmm. and uh, after that it sort of died down in the year that followed because Leafy stopped doing videos. Oh yeah, because because and of then... the incident. <laughs> <laughs> the, the incident, the judgment day, if you will. Um, but then I started getting more into, you know, like Fallout content. Like I saw watching Oxhorn um, and people like that. Then I also started watching reaction commentary. So people like Just Destiny oh, okay. and Trigger I Trope. Never... And then I stopped that because I found it yeah, really like, cringe. Just Destiny, I, 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 it's hard to say this now because like obviously like the tom video came out so it's like it's very it's very easy for someone to say you know i never had a good vibe about that guy kind of like with with uh, trisha paytas did with shane dawson even though like she was really cool with him yeah up to that yeah point. like i like yeah i just i never i never like really i i, I hate because like I, I can't say this about basically using her same wording is like I, the dude didn't rub me off the right way, if that makes any sense. The vibes were off. I get you. Um, yeah, yeah. The, vi the vibes were very off with with this individual. <laughs> so, so. I get what you mean. I mean, that's why I kind of stopped watching him because something about him and like the way he he kind of acted in his videos was just kind of. Uh, did you know he rebranded? So he rebranded. Yeah, he's still doing content now, but he rebranded himself. I think exactly, yeah, I forget exactly what his uh, new channel is, but if you look up Just Destiny, an entirely different channel from him pulls up. Well, I say entirely different. It's the same channel, but... I'm going to do that. I'm so the question right is, now. if you don't like Flamenco, what do you think of Aiden? Uh, Aiden has a couple good points, but at the same time, he's just as insufferable. I, I don't know. I, I've seen too like, many clips. Uh, I've seen too many commentary aids clips of him sparging. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, a lot of the time, like, dude, you know your life is going downhill when Aiden Project starts to make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, like, when did he make but, sense? Uh, That's the question. <laughs> dude, I, I kind of understand what he was talking about when he was molding about flamenco. But that's mainly because I dislike flamenco over some idiotic Right, right, I mean, there, like, there, there's um, some bias there. There is some bias. I'll agree there, and I'm I'm probably get like I, I am open to getting shit on mm -hmm. because I don't well, like well, flamenco. Well, don't worry. Like two uh, people are gonna be seeing this, and no, none of them. I mean, it's it's nothing personal with the guy. It's not like I, I dislike uh -huh. him as a person. It's more like I dislike the the way he acts and the way he the, what he brings well, to the like, table. Uh, can, and can you bring? You know a, I mean? could, give me an example. Of what your in your opinion was a a, a, a bad take from him. I can't remember what it was, but something he said, which was easily explainable. Um, it was in an After Hours episode that was that it was quite a while ago now, like two to three mm. months ago, um, before Augie moved, and he said something that I was like, "Dude, this is so fucking easily explainable," and the other people have literally explained it to you. How the fuck does this not make sense? Uh, how does this not compute mm. in your brain? And I was like, this this guy's I, I can't handle it. He's 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 going out of his way to to make this not make sense in his head when it's it's yeah. easily explainable. I can't remember what it was, but that really ticked um, me off. And I was like, oh, uh, come uh, on, honestly, dude. Um, to a lesser extent, I feel that kind of way with Nick sometimes because I feel like Nick's talking points are more semantical than anything else. So like for ex a lot of his talking points. Yeah, because like a good a good yeah. example of this is like um, the Aiden Ron's like milf token thing. He's like, yeah, but where's yep. the line? Where's the line, guys? And I thought like, well, like I I think Bo Blacks and Flamenco made it pretty clear that the line was giving your fan base like scam bad scam slash bad financial advice. Yeah. But, like I thought they made that pretty clear. 
But then Nick was like, oh, where's the line, guys? Where's the line? I also think, um, like, my, my somewhat dislike of Flamenco's presence kind of started with, uh, well, when he f when he first started to come on the show, I was like, mm, this guy seems a bit boring. Mm. Um, and then he never really said anything that made me laugh, unlike Augie did, unlike Bo Blacks did, unlike Nick did, unlike anybody did, really. Mm. And it was just like, ah, like, it, it, what is this guy adding that, that makes the show enjoyable? I don't see how people can really enjoy his presence, because it's not something that I... I'm finding very funny or entertaining or anything and then he has the, on top of that he, he started having these really idiotic takes that were easily explainable at least that one that I've explained that I can't put my uh, finger can you, on can you, and that I've totally can you name any about. like recent ones or at least ones that you can remember I can't remember any of them because I've just tried to phase it out of my mind because I, I want to enjoy after hours but flamenco kind of you know kind of threw me off a bit especially mm. with that um, but yeah, he had this idiotic take, and also I found his his presence kind of boring. And that's nothing to, to you know, shit on anybody who likes him or shit on him as a person. It's just my personal okay. opinion, you know? Like, it's much like people could find my content boring, mm -hmm. you know? Because I'm just sitting there explaining shit that most people will already find out through the game. Yeah. You know? Um... It's a matter For of personally, I, I really like Flamenco. I think like he he brings a more my my point of view is like he brings a more down to earth perspective of it, you know? Cause like uh, uh I get I, I get I kind of get cause, that. Cause, I cause like you know everyone there like even him like they kind of have like the Spurg energy, you know? Cause like they're very <laughs> very, very quick to like blow things out you know for for comedic for sometimes comedic effect for sometimes they're like they're generally frustrated with stuff but like he's a bit more he's a, yeah from from for, for my perspective anyway he's a bit more calmer when it comes to stuff oh he's definitely like one of the more calming uh members of rfc but i also think that makes him one of the less interesting ones. Oh, I, I get that um, perspective but i suppose that's just a matter of his perspective like augie i find funny because he just makes a bunch of edgy jokes mm -hmm. all the time bo blacks like says shit that doesn't mean to be funny but ends up being funny like for example the tits and pussy oh, and yeah. ass thing that was <laughs> hilarious um and also he had like that freak out where he was like let me speak that, that was, was more hilarious. That, i don't think that was rfc that was more like just like their among us to tournament stuff well yeah my, my point still stands because like you know that that's kind of bo blacks uh -huh. character um and then Turkey Tom's kind of similar to uh, to Augie in some ways, and Nick, I agree with a lot of what Nick has mm -hmm. to say, and also he has a lot of comedic shit to bring yeah. as well. So that's kind the, of my. The way I look things. at it is with with again, this is gonna make it sound like I absolutely hate Nick, which I don't. Nick's that a he's that guy who's the asshole, but he's a very talented asshole, so you have to keep him around. Yeah, he's he's like a, a somewhat wise and calculated mm -hmm. asshole, I suppose. That, that's a cool way to way to look at things because he's very well thought out uh he definitely dedicates a lot of time into thinking you know ab about certain situations mm -hmm. all right what's right what's wrong is there any evidence to back any of these sides and he, he's very by the book and i admire him for that uh and it shows yeah. in his videos which are not only very well edited but very well researched now as the well. person but which by the way when i say i i, I least like them uh yeah, i still like them um, Turkey Tom, I would say, yeah. is the person I, I least like out of that whole group, because like, he... I hate to be like, oh, you made mistakes like four years ago, but like, but like, I, I don't know, because like, I, I was watching uh, a lot of his content as it was emerging, so like, I, I was... I, I remember that... I remember watching the uh, Mr. Enter video when it first came out. So like... Mm. Seeing it, and because like I, I was actually watching Mr. Enter at the time too, because like he, because like I was still watching a lot of like review type content. So so like yeah, I don't know, um, him calling someone I watched a pedophile, which I know. To be clear, he's obviously he's backed off from that point. He said he acknowledged that it was a bad like point to make against Mr. Enter, but like. The, the consistency of that same mistake, too, because, like, the most recent one being with Pyro, you know? Yeah, I, I see what you mean there. Um, 
personally, I, I, I tend not to fault anybody on shit like that. Like, for example, I, I can still enjoy John's one, even though what he did was, was quite mm-hmm. bad. Um, like, I, I really dislike what he what he put everybody through. Like, um, not community wise. I feel like that's very simple yeah. to deal with. Like, I'm not like personally yeah, like, like offended or like distraught yeah. or heartbroken. I more feel for the people that he lied to, and then they. Well, stuck my up point for of view him. of it is like the friends have clearly forgiven him at this at this point. They've forgiven him like months ago. So like, why should I care when the main people involved don't even care at this point? You know. I don't. I, th- I think they forgave him, but they they're, they're still not. Bo Blax is you know, cool. On decent Bo Blacks terms. Is cool with him. Bo, Bla- Bo Blacks is cool with him, but that's that's in Bo Blacks's nature. Bo Blacks is a really uh, chill I know, guy. Um, I think Tipster. Tipster is cool with him. Uh, do you know who Internet Unwind is? I think Jake. Yes, I think Jake's Jake. cool with him. Uh, I don't really watch Internet Unwind very much, so I can't really say his hmm. take on things. But I think. Augie speaks to him from time to time, mm-hmm. and I think Nick might have completely cut himself off. But no, I don't, I don't know. think no, because like I, rem- I remember Nick mentioned that uh, him and John were like trading like ideas and stuff. So I, I think they're cool now. I, I but I can imagine that was a very long process because like Nick, out of all of them, was sticking his neck out the most for John. Like he, yeah. like he almost uh, burned a bridge with Tommy. <laughs> Like, literally, John's antics cause Nick a lot of, like, I guess you could call it, like, trouble, mm-hmm. stress, I don't know. And um, to, to for, for Nick to, like, forgive him and, like, become somewhat alright with him again, if not friends, acquaintances, mm-hmm. is uh, quite admirable. I, I, I feel like it would take, I, I if I was in his position... I would not be so forgiving. Mm. And then again, I don't really know if Nick is or not. I, I fail to pay uh, attention sometimes to, to what people's opinions honestly, are. Honestly, I, I, I personally don't know how I would react in that situation. I mean, like, I would I would hopefully, like, in the best of situations, try to reconnect with the person after uh, a certain amount of time. And, I like, yeah, I hope, I honestly do hope for the best with everyone in this community. Even, like, the people who I heavily, like, um, he- heavily disagree with like people like uh, Jalen. Like I, I hope uh, yeah. I hope like the best things happen to each in- in- individual person. <laughs> I know that sounds like goody goody, but I, like, uh, that's just my perspective. Like I just hope they all like. G- I hope for good outcomes. On the topic of Jalen, <laughs> uh, I hope they get oh, yeah. help. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That's. Yeah. All I, that's all I hope for. They are fucking disgusting in what they've said in the past, and what they've said to certain people, and what they've said about religions mm-hmm. in particular. That was like I, extremely I, bad. I've, and if, keep in mind, yeah, I'm not religious. I feel, I feel like at and, a certain point, though, I think I think Jalen was trying to turn it into a troll, like saying that Hitler was right. Like I think no one other than a neo-nazi actually has that take so i feel like jalen was trying I, no I yeah think, of course i think jalen was just trying to turn that situation into a troll yeah it was, it was damage control it was very poor mm-hmm. damage control but like when they they said what they said whether they meant it or not it was fucked up mm-hmm. and well, uh, like, that, that put a really really bad taste in my mouth and like it, it made me question you know why are all these these commentators you know like like tipster and like nick and people like that um, sticking around with well, this, appa- this appa- person. Because it was like really apparently they're up. just really nice behind the scenes. Like even Tom said that in his Tom a- After Dark video about it. Like apparently they're just like a really really nice individual, which I would love to see. Like I I, I want. We don't yeah, see I, that. I would though. love yeah. to see that personality in the videos. Like uh, um, uh, imagine like a completely like because like obviously like um, Leafy was like the really trolly side of like that topic commentary but like imagine if we got like the complete opposite of that with Jalen and from like what they're what they're saying that that's apparently Jalen like they're just like really really nice individuals and so it's it's interesting to what what, what, what am I getting at with this I, I, I would but basically the run run rundown is 
I would like to see more of like the real Jalen that everyone keeps talking about because like the two sides of Jalen that we see are the more bland side who you know is in the visual in the videos which you can argue is necessary yeah like a, a content yeah which you can yeah. argue is necessary to have like a more bland perspective if you're just giving general information but then you also have like the really uh trolly side which you know like troll 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 trolling is um it's it's okay like um well yeah well uh, i like trolling. yeah we all we all do a little trolling we're in the commentary i mean uh, we're we're yeah, we, we we're, do a little viewers trolling. in the commentary community i should say uh, n neither me or you as or actual commentators I, I i would be eaten alive if i try to do commentary full on um yeah um, but like like I, I don't know but like point point is from like what people are saying we are apparently neither like on on twitter and in the videos we aren't getting the real Jalen. so like if we got the real maybe because like i know she has like more casual like gameplay channels like the secondary channels that she has i grant i haven't watched that so maybe her real personality comes through in that stuff but like in terms of the mainline videos i i haven't seen like the real Jalen. I would love to see the real Jalen. You know, I would like to see Jalen as a happy individual who is openly allowed to be who she is. But yeah. you know, at the same time, you, you <laughs> you're telling people to unironically get cancer and die. Like I get like that. Yeah, get, that, that's, that, that, that's those put bad. Cool. Those, that puts a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> I, I I can't. I, I, like. Hello there folks, it's Nerdy John, and after this point in the recording, the Wanderer's internet kind of went out, so we weren't able to do a proper closer. So here it is right now. Please go check his channel out, uh, link for it will be in the, the description, and I'm really happy to be doing podcasting again. Hopefully the next episode won't um, take as long to get underway. And you all have a lovely day. This is Nerdy John, signing out.